Yeah, well, I appreciate your vote of confidence, but I'm not gonna ask for a rematch anytime soon. If I even see another Viltrumite, I'm gonna... Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Invincible Season 2 Episode 5 video. Episodes are finally back, so if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get them all. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll just start at the beginning of the episode and work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along. Careful for spoilers for the episode if you haven't seen it yet, but just starting at the beginning, the actual episode title is This Must Come as a Shock, which is a reference to a couple of the different storylines. The Sequids storyline coming for Earth, where Shapesmith is like, well, this must come as a shock, but I'm actually a Martian, when it turns out that the entire team knew the entire time and just let him onto the team, except for Black Samson. I love the record scratch moment there, where he's like, wait, wait a minute, you've been a Martian this whole time? He's like the only guy that didn't know. You all knew that? It's also a reference to Mark's storyline coming back to Earth with Oliver and introducing him to Debbie and him sort of integrating with the family. Like, this might come as a shock, but there's like a new half-brother that I have now that we need to take care of. So they're trying to start off the second half of the season with the banger. Like, they ended on a big cliffhanger. There's even a post credit scene at the end of the episode explaining what happened to Alan the alien. It's all right out of the comics, so we'll just break it down as we go along. The actual opening scene is meant to open immediately after the end of episode 4, where General Craig and the Viltrumites leave the planet with Omni-Man in tow, taking him to their Viltrumite prison. We'll probably learn about that either in episode 6 or episode 7. Leaving Invincible to just pass out in the ashes for a little while until he's found by some Klaxons who take him back to the city. And essentially this first part of the episode is him just helping them rebuild over the course of a couple months. They basically explain that he was on the planet for two months, which doesn't seem like that long, but all the Klaxons that he knew when he came to the planet are now super old, like that's how quickly they age. This whole scene where he talks to Andresa and she sort of gives him the pep talk they released earlier this year, the whole idea is that he's super down on what happened to the planet being almost destroyed, all this collateral damage, because he thinks that anywhere he and his father go, it just spells doom for wherever they are, like they only cause trouble no matter what they try to do. She tries to get him to see the more positive side of things, like, no, you could actually be here, like, you helped us survive. Things would have only eventually ended badly for us. Basically trying to remind him that he can be a superhero, like, this is the whole idea, like, you want him to become a superhero. When this klaxon comes to tell him that there's a ship ready to take him home, this is the same one from before, also setting up the Andresa twist, where she shows up and is super old now, like, it's been two months, but she's this old maid now, about to die. Your brother ages quicker than you but far slower than my people. I'll be gone before he can form a sentence. Basically to set the whole idea of why he has to take Oliver back with him, like this wasn't gonna be a problem when your father was still here because he's a Viltrumite, he's basically going to live effectively forever unless another Viltrumite tries to kill him. Invincible also explains that when he was younger, Omni-Man was also worried about that same idea with him, like would he outlive him because he's half human? They get into the weeds a little bit more with this whole concept in the comics, but because of his half-human biology, he'd normally live for upwards of like a couple hundred thousand years, like a long, long time. Oliver's half klaxon DNA, though, will cut his lifetime a little bit shorter, but it'll still be extremely long. Essentially, the Viltrumite side of their DNA overpowers their other half of their DNA, and eventually they start to resemble more full Viltrumites, like their body almost seems like it's full Viltrumite, even though Oliver's lifespan won't be nearly as long as Invincible's. But one of the benefits to that, though, is that he does mature very fast, so he will come into his powers way faster than Invincible did. There are a couple of mic drop record scratch moments in the episode with big setups, like Invincible says, oh, things are probably fine on Earth, the Guardians of the Globe will take care of everything, setting up the cut to with their fight with Omnipotus, like things are definitely not going well, they almost die. Tremble before my unlimited power! No. He's meant to be a parody of Galactus from Marvel Comics. His backstory in the Invisible Universe is kind of a parody of Galactus's origin story. He travels from universe to universe, destroying each one, then moving to the next. He's also voiced by Ross Marcand, who voiced a couple different characters in the episode, who is also from The Walking Dead, which is how Robert Kirkman got him to do the episode, because Robert Kirkman is the creator of Invincible, and he's the creator of The Walking Dead. But a lot of you also probably remember that Ross Marcan now does the voice for Red Skull in the Marvel Universe. He also does the voice for Ultron. He did it during What If. He also does it during the live action Ultron stuff now too because James Spader isn't doing the voice anymore. From here, I can see everything. No one can stop me now. 
There are a lot of instances in the episode where you have the same actor playing a couple different characters. Some of them are just for side characters with one line, like not really important characters. Like they needed extra bodies and they were in the recording booth. Like, hey, could you record a couple lines for this random character in the background here? But essentially this scene of them fighting Omnipotus is right out of the comics. And even though they make it seem like they almost die, they do eventually stop him and push him back through a portal into another universe. In the comics, his main power is basically just reshaping everything around him, sort of like the way the Galactus consumes planets. Invincible returns back to Earth, introduces Oliver to his mom, explains everything about Omni-Man that's happened the past couple of months. He's still alive. He's been captured by the Viltrumites, explains the secret mission that General Craig gave him to take over his father's mission. Like, now it's your job to take over Earth. And the idea they're going to send a Viltrumite to check on him and make sure that he's continuing the mission the way that they told him to. There are a couple of teaser for that in the trailer for the second half of the season. That's going to be Anissa. So don't worry, we'll talk about that when we get to that episode because it's still a little ways off. She is going to wreck him and this is only their first meeting. Like the crazy stuff when people talk about Anissa doesn't even happen till much, much later in the story. Like this is just the first time that they meet. When he's arguing with his mother about what they're going to do with Oliver, like we can't just turn him over to Cecil, he's going to be purple for a long time, so we can't just give him to another random person or let him run around outside unfettered. Part of the idea is that he won't be purple forever, and like I said, he does mature very fast. He comes into his powers much quicker than Invincible did. So they spend most of the episode with Debbie just sort of warming up to him, and he does just become a natural member of the family, like Debbie does love him like another son, eventually. But I think just based on the timeline that they have on the shows, by the time we get to season three, he will have already come into his powers. He might still be purple though, but eventually what does happen to him is that the Viltrumite half of his DNA starts to take over his body so his skin no longer looks purple once he fully matures, but that still takes a little while to happen. During their talk, he also gets mad at her because he thinks that she got rid of all of Omni-Man's stuff. Like, what a minute, I was looking for his books. He told me to read his books before the Viltrumites took him away. That's meant to be a teaser for all the special people that he's meant to go around the universe finding who have weapons or who are strong enough to fight Viltrumites. They continue the Donald arc from the first half of the season. He's essentially learned he's a cyborg clone of his original self. The reason why he has all the memories that he had before is because they were able to save his original brain. Cecil also reveals that there's a secret area inside the White Room, possibly multiple secret areas, like it's compartmentalized, so there are like other secret places in here that not everybody knows about. This whole storyline for him is also right out of the comics. He's essentially like a backup cloned cyborg version of Donald. Then they go back to Invincible's college dorm room. You see William. He's got all those pop culture references around the place. The Magnum P.I. poster is a Magnum Pi poster, as in the mathematical equation Pi. Everyone knows what DTF means. No explanation needed there. The Little Boss poster is a reference to Little Nas, and the Lady Yaya poster obviously a reference to Lady Gaga. When Cecil shows up to check on him, there's more tension because he left Earth against his orders. They explain the rest of what happened with the Guardians of the Globe. They eventually did defeat Omnipotus, like I said, but they want to tease the deterioration of his relationship with Cecil. Like, they don't come to blows or anything like that, but you can sense things are really tense between them, especially over what's going to happen to Oliver, ultimately. Part of the reason why Invincible doesn't want to give Oliver to Cecil is because he's worried about what Cecil will do with him, basically just turn him into a glorified experiment, just running experiments on him like a guinea pig over and over again, trying to weaponize him. And part of the idea they teased during season one and the first half of season two is one of the reasons why Invincible ultimately turned good and turned against his father, against the Viltrumites, is because of the positive influence when he was raised by his mother. So Invincible is hoping the same thing will happen to Oliver, like if they raise him in a good environment, like they give him a good upbringing, he will also turn into a superhero just like Invincible. But generally Invincible's relationship with Cecil will just continue to deteriorate over matters like this, big arguments that they'll just continue to have. Who also reveals that the Global Defense Agency has been lowjacking, monitoring his mother's house. So he's already heard everything that he told his mother. Omni-Man's still alive. The Viltrumites are still out there. They'll eventually come back to Earth to check on him. When he eventually does check in with Amber, he tells her everything that happened and she kind of explains how she's been depressed and she's been having her own problems too. They're kind of teasing the deterioration of their relationship too, just because there is no way, absolutely no way, he can still be invincible and a regular dude going to college leading a regular life at the same time. Like it's just not going to happen. One of the changes the show has made to the comics is with this whole relationship with Amber. It eventually dissolves much quicker in the comics. I'm guessing they'll wait till the end of this season before they completely break up. 
They cut to the Guardians of the Glow training session to show off more of their skills and prep for the fights that they have at the end of the episode. Robot's plan to fix Monster Girl's reverse aging is essentially like a version of what he did to himself, but in reverse. Cloning another body for her, but an older version of her body, transferring her consciousness to it so that she could essentially restart her aging clock back to zero. So that each time she uses her power, she grows younger. All you need is just to clone an older body and just do that over and over again, and she could just keep using her powers. Then they introduce the main threat of the episode, the Sequids, coming to Earth on the stolen spaceship that they teased in the first half of the season, sending everyone they have except for Shrinking Ray, Duplicate, and Rexplode because they're the ones that wind up having to fight the Lizard League. They had the whole record drop kind of funny moment where everybody reveals that they knew that Shapesmith was a Martian this whole time, except for Black Samson. I think just so they could have that funny moment where there's like one guy who just didn't know. Then they do another record scratch moment, like another funny cut to moment where he's revealing his backstory of how he came to Earth. They want to make it seem all hopeful. They use all this hopeful music. But then they all realize the whole reason the Sequids are threatening Earth in the first place is because they hitched a ride using the astronaut that he stranded back on Mars. So had he not done that, there would be no trouble. Like everything that's happening now is completely his fault. So the Guardians of the Globe kind of want to kill him right now, and all the Martians that he left back on Mars also kind of want to kill him. They get more help from Adam Eve, who'd been living with her parents for the past couple of months. They try to give Rexplode a moment of redemption too when he gives her that whole pep talk to set up the big twist at the end of the episode where he almost seemingly dies. Like they want to make you think that he's going to die. Just so that he doesn't seem like a complete ass bag. Like, oh yeah, I'm terrible, but he does do some nice things. They also use the scene to remind you about her backstory in that Adam Eve prequel episode, which went so hard. Like, her backstory is almost as tragic, if not more tragic, than Invincible's backstory. Her entire biological family, her real mother, the children that were created in the lab using her mother, who had been put in the test tube, barely alive. If you didn't watch that episode, essentially they all died. Like, she says that here in this moment. Like, they're all dead. They remind you about their history together, her time on the Teen Team, which are essentially a parody of the Teen Titans. Inside the Invincible universe, the Guardians of the Globe are also kind of like a parody of the Justice League or the Avengers. And Cecil goes to get Invincible's help with the Sequids so that he joins the mission too, giving him that reunion with Adam Eve. In probably like the billionth record scratch moment in the episode, Rex Splode sort of sets up the twist with the Lizard League saying, there's no way, absolutely no way, there'd be two major problems that they have to deal with at the same time queuing the Lizard League attacking the military base to try and steal its nuclear weapons. When they're on the spaceship, the Star Trek reference is sort of like a double inside joke because Robot references Star Trek and Robot is voiced by Zachary Quinto, who also plays Spock in the new Star Trek movies. They make it on board the Martian ship and start fighting the Sequids just as the B-team on Earth starts fighting the Lizard League and they cut back and forth between both fights for the rest of the episode, sort of showing you both of the teams almost dying. Like, part of the idea is they want to make it seem like all hope is lost in both instances, like they're both teams are going to lose. They remind you what happens to duplicates' bodies when they're destroyed, like they die just like regular bodies. And when that happens, like when one of her bodies is destroyed, she feels the pain of that body's death as if it were her dying too. So each time during this fight, when one of those bodies gets squished to nothingness, gets ripped apart, she feels it just like it was happening to her until her final body is killed before she can spawn another one that can escape, so R.I.P. Or it seems like she's dead. There are a couple moments like that in the episode in the fights where they want to make you think that a couple of the characters have died, like not just one, but a couple of them have died. Shrinking Ray pulls a couple of Ant-Man style kills, one of them basically damaging his brain going in through his eye. It's kind of like what Ant-Man did to Iron Man's suit during Avengers Endgame, just completely frying it. Just gonna scramble this brain up like a bunch of eggs. Then she tries to pull a reverse Thanos on the big one, but isn't strong enough to destroy his body when she tries to grow bigger. And even though you hear all the bone crunching, they want to make you think that she is dead. I think, you know, early theory, she survived because Rexplode winds up blowing up his head, creating an exit point for her. They end their fight with King Lizard having him with a gun to the head, dead to rights, after he's gotten his hand chewed off by the big lizard. And even though he basically tells him to just go ahead and do it, like, fine, just do it, I think they're trying to tease that one of the other characters has survived, and I think it's going to be Shrinking Ray. I think she'll probably grow bigger and help save him. But I do think the duplicate is dead. They end the A-team's fight in the episode at the mercy of the Sequids after Adam E passes out, so her shield falls, leaving them all vulnerable to the Sequids. 
And as they cut to black, they have a post credit scene, like big surprise. They did a post credit scene before during the Invincible episode. So it's not like the first time they've ever done this. But it's Alan the alien essentially waking up inside his regeneration chamber. His powers have healed the damage the Viltrumites did him and his body has grown back stronger because that's the way he was designed when they created him. But they wind up playing it for a joke because Alan doesn't understand that part of how his powers work until Thetis shows up and explains everything to him. Like, oh, you know, I unplugged your life support system so that your powers would kick in and you would heal the damage and grow back stronger. So now you're strong enough to actually go toe to toe with a single Viltrumite. Just to explain the technicalities behind that too, this will continue to happen to him. So if like a bunch of Viltrumites gang up on him and try to kill him again, if he almost dies, he can actually heal the damage and come back even stronger. So like he can keep doing this, coming back stronger and stronger and stronger. But they also play this for a reveal of Thetis revealing his backstory as a Viltrumite. Like he starts talking about how he'd be so angry if the Viltrumite showed up. Just as Thetis rips off his false beard, it doesn't sound so false though, like it actually sounds like the hair is ripping off the skin. If I even see another Viltrumite, I'm gonna... You're a Viltrumite?! That's a moment that's right out of the comics too, like Thetis revealing himself because of the mustache. Like all Viltrumites have some kind of mustache. He also starts to explain his backstory as previously being the only Viltrumite to ever rebel against the Viltrumite Empire until Invincible came along and now Omni-Man who's also standing against the Viltrumites and we have Oliver too who will help stand against them. So they're like a bunch of Viltrumites now that they have to help them against them. Thetis actually comes from the original Viltrumite Civil War that saw the killing of their original Emperor Argyll and the ascension of Thrag and the original Scourge Virus. The whole idea is that as he's told Alan the alien, he saw their people conquering other races long ago before the Civil War, but Thetis assassinates their original emperor, kind of throwing them into chaos. Then he goes off and creates the Scourge virus, which kills off most of the Viltrumites, leading to their new plan of them sending people around the universe like Omni-Man going to Earth, creating a half-sun, then taking over the planet using that half-Viltrumite. When Thetis initially did that, he also created the Coalition of Planets, like he's the originator of the Coalition of Planets. So he's been cooking this long-term plan to try and find a way to finally stop the Viltrumites for many thousands of years. Like it's been a long, long time. We'll continue to learn more about his origin story and how he connects to the history of the Viltrumite Empire and how everybody else in the story connects to that as well too, like Omni-Man. There's some stuff in their story that they'll probably save for much, much later seasons, but the story is all out there in the comics. If you want to go read it, you can actually go do that right now. And basically, Thetis is sending Alan back to Earth to get Invincible's help so they can kind of start this process. This will probably wind up dovetailing with Omni-Man breaking out of the Viltrumite prison. Like, they're just going to be teasing that in the next couple of episodes, so that might wind up being a season three kind of thing. I think most of the rest of the season is dedicated to paying off the Angstrom-Levy storyline with Invincible versus Angstrom-Levy in the finale. This is just the beginning though, like they wanted to start things off with a banger, big cliffhanger like everybody's gonna die, but secretly they'll find some way to save the day. They did release a trailer for like the entire second half of the season. I did a breakdown video of that, so I'll post a link for it in the description below. But there's a bunch of stuff that we didn't see in this first episode. So like I said, I think they want to close down the Angstrom-Levy arc, or this part of the Angstrom-Levy arc, because it doesn't go away completely by the end of this season. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references in the episode, so if you spotted any that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My full Invincible Season 2 Episode 6 video will post next week after they release it. And the other big reminder is that Marvel is starting to release X-Men 97 episodes starting next week. And I'll be doing episode videos for that too. So really good news is that we'll have X-Men episodes and Invincible episodes at the same time for the next couple months. I just did a brand new X-Men video. Click here for that and click here for my Invincible Season 2 Episode 6 video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.